my mind right now is going in every direction because I, I don't think that this message is the message for today. And that's okay. All right? Everybody read this with me. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe that this morning? Man, you know, I don't know if, do you guys believe that this morning? You know, I'm not trying to get you riled up about anything, but do you believe that this morning? (laughs) How can you get out of bed and just mope through the morning, I'm going to go to church? When there is life in you, the life that was, that is, the life that is Christ dwelling in you, and you get to get up in the morning, put your shoes on, well, I hope you put your pants on first or whatever it is you got going on. You get your clothes on, and you go and you brush your teeth, and you look in the mirror, and you look at yourself in the eye, and you say, Christ is living in you. Can you get excited about that this morning? Because we serve a risen Savior, not one that has been in the grave or is in the grave. We know that the grave is empty. The tomb is empty. The wall, the stone had been rolled away. And we know that He is risen. And why do we know? How do we know that He is risen? Because dozens and thousands, well, I'm just going to say thousands of people have died for the cause of a risen Savior. Died, as, as Robert described it this morning boiled, cut in half, their heads taken off. They didn't do it for a lie. And I know, for me personally, I know that my Savior is alive, and I know that He is living within me. And I know that outside of me, He dwells at at other times because I have felt His presence. I have felt his goodness. I have felt his brace, embrace around me. I have felt his love pour over me. I have seen him come to me as I sit on a balcony and the room behind me is flooded and bloated with more people that are out in here. But I'm sitting out there on the patio and I felt the Lord standing there next to me and saying, you're going to be okay. I'm here. What do you want? Is it comfort that you want? Yes, Lord, I need comfort right now. I need to know everything. Am I following you like I'm supposed to? Am I living like I should? Do I have enough faith to continue the mission? Yes, you do. Because all you have to know is that I'm right here. For some of us, that's what we need, don't we? We need that assurance that he's right there. That he is watching out for us. That he is looking out for us. That he is in you. Because otherwise his scripture would not be fulfilled that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And you know, I I believe that this morning that there are people, even in here, there are people in here that that don't quite, haven't quite had that touch of the Lord. Haven't quite had that that aha moment when you begin to realize (laughs) he's alive in me. That's my proof. As Robert said, I want to do the things, I I don't want to do the things that I used to want to do. I do the things that he wants me to do. I have died to myself. I I am no longer living in the world. I'm no longer living in the flesh. Oh, but I can walk in the world just like you're walking in the world right now. But I can be apart from that because I am going to, I'm going to bring service to the Lord. I'm going to walk in the, in the statutes that he's placed before me, in the, in the steps that he's guided me through so that I can bring his presence into wherever I go. Amen? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. This is what love looks like. It's a closed tomb with a cross, the shadow of the cross laid upon it. That's what love looks like. Some of us don't understand that. See, we think that, a lo- that love is alive, don't we? It should be. Love should be alive. And, and we, we fight and we, we, we claw and we try to keep that, that love alive. But this is what true love looks like. Jesus said, unless a grain of seed falls into the ground... 
it'll produce a lot. Did he produce a lot? Amen. There are a lot of people that are following the Lord this, this morning. I think about this morning, man. What an awesome day. Today would be the good day for the rapture to happen, wouldn't it? Yeah. Amen. Turn with me, if you will. Okay, before we get it, I want to do a little backtracking because I, I like backtracking some stories before I actually get into the main topic of things. Let's do a little backtracking. Turn with me, if you will, John, to John 8, 53. And it's really important that I start here because in order to understand who Christ was, we've got to know who he represented, who he said he was, all right, or who he said he is. So turned, I hope you brought your, bring a little wet napkin or something because you're going to be thumbing through some Bible scripture. Are you ready? Yes. Amen. 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 I'm glad. His proclamation of deity in, in uh, John 8, 53, it says, his, he's talking to the, to the uh, Jews in the temple. And he says to them, or they say to him, are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. Boom, he put him in their place. But I do know him, and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he said it, or he saw it, and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He, was the, he is the great I am. He is God incarnate. The Lord stepped down and took place as a man so that he could step into that place of priesthood so that he could, he could, he could understand us. See, how do you understand anything unless you take and, and, and become part of it? God wanted to, to understand what he had created, and therefore he stepped in as a man and began to see and feel as we do. I'm sure, he, I'm sure as, as Jesus walked the earth, he felt fear, he felt resentment, he felt anger, he felt all these emotions that we come in contact with every day, yet he sinned not. Amen? All right. Oh, I forgot to show you the picture. These are just crazy pictures I found. That's all right. In Matthew 26, 26. We're going to take a look at this, the Last Supper. Matthew 26, 26. And we'll partake of this at the end of service here because I want to make sure we have an understanding of this. In verse 26, or sorry, yeah, Matthew 26, 26. It says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave, gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. How many of you are excited for that cup of wine with the Lord in his kingdom? Amen. That alone is something to look forward to. Matthew 26, 36. I think I, yeah, 26, 36. That was the prayer in the garden. Matthew 26, 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? We had 21 days of prayer at the beginning of the year. One hour of prayer, both morning and evening. How long was that one hour? Very fast, wasn't it? 
And it seemed like the more we did it, the faster it got. And it was because we were spending time with the Lord. Right? Amen is, or, or sorry, amen. Prayer is, prayer is very important to God. Let's see. Then he came to his disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. How many of you experienced that weak flesh? The spirit indeed, indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of the sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. The garden prayer for you and for me. I can't, I can't, I can't uh, share. In the garden, okay, Judas comes up. Jesus says, Our, my, my, my betrayer is at hand. Judas comes up, gives him a kiss, right? Peter takes action. He draws the sword, cuts the, the servant's ear off. Jesus, in the middle of being arrested, he stops and he heals the guy's ear. Now, if you were that guy, would you say, wait a minute. I was hurting a little bit ago, but now I'm healed. There's something to this. But he, again, still goes on with him, right? He still goes on. To, to, they, they beat him up pretty good. But that's the thing. Jesus, in the time of, of, of trouble, still has time to help. Okay? They take him away. They arrest him. They lead, they lead him away in chains to the, uh, to the Sanhedrin. They question and beat him. They pluck his beard. They spit on his face. They jailed him until the next day. That's crazy. I feel like I want to get into a lot of that stuff, but I can't because I don't want to take up too much time of what I do have. They get him in front of the... I mean, this was a, a movie. How many of you have you seen The Passion of the Christ? All right? And they, they really did beat him. When I went to go see that, it was quiet in the theater. Nobody knew what to say or said anything because it was so just awful. The Passion, it had... A, a, a pretty good example of what happened to him, but in reality, man, it was worse. It was. So they brought him before uh, Pilate, and then they took him to he Herod, Herod, sorry, Herod, and then back to Pilate again. Pilate wanted to let him go. He was trying to get the, calm, the crowd to calm down, he wanted to let him go, and then he gives him an alternative. I got this guy over here, his name's Barabbas, he's, you know, he's, he's a murderer, he's caused an uproar, he's done a lot of bad things. You want him to let go? I'm sure, I'm sure, I can just hear him back there, they're not going to let, they're not going to want this guy over Jesus. They've got to take Jesus. And so he offers that, that choice to them, and the people holler out even more, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Imagine in your lifetime of sin. Every time that you sinned, you would hear those words, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Imagine that, because that's what happened every time that we sin. That's what sin looked like, that shout of crucify him. There had to be a wage for our sin, because the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Oh, I want to go back to that. I'm not done there yet. You know, in the movie, it shows where Barabbas is getting ready to step down. He makes eye contact with Jesus. And I'll bet he's wondering to himself, wait a minute, I'm getting off free. This guy's taking my place. And all he could think about was where, where he was headed. Revenge. A life of, of destitute again. A life of trying to... You know, I, I messed up the first time. I could do it right this time. I'm going to really know how to get these guys this time. Thinking of all that revenge and, and different things that he could really get dipped into. 
and not taking a moment and realizing that righteousness was passing him by. I was Barabbas. My dad was Barabbas. We had every right to be on that cross, but yet Jesus stepped in and took that cross for us. And he said, no, not today. Today you'll be with me in paradise because you believe. Amen? So Pontius Pilate, he's standing up there and he's saying, surely, you know, I can't find anything wrong with him. Behold the man. And he's showing him Jesus and how he had been just pummeled. They put a crown of thorns on his head and they had to push it down with reeds because they couldn't touch the thorns. Heaven forbid that they poked themselves. And those thorns were about three inches thick. So if they're pushing down on his head, where do you think they went? They, they, they had to have sewn between the skull and the, and the skin. Excruciating pain. They whipped him 49 times minus one because at 49, they figured that the person could die. See, they were very intricate about how they kill people. They were very good at it. They were like today's mafia, maybe. They knew how to kill people. They knew what wouldn't kill people. So when they, they told somebody, you're going to only wish you were dead, they knew what they were talking about. Finally, Pilate gives in. He says, fine, all right. He washes his hand on the whole thing and he says, okay, you take him. You crucify him. Isaiah 57 says, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. What does that look like? That's set in his life to a purpose, committed to God, embracing the cross, the very cross that would bring death. Some of us have a hard time embracing ministry alone. It's so hard, Lord. It's hard. But it's not for you, it's for him. He's worthy. He is worthy of all sacrifice. He is worthy of, of losing sleep. He is worthy of, of hours and hours of prayer. He is worthy. Amen? John 19, 29. Let's take a look at that now. Nineteen twenty nine. Are you there? It says now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, "It is finished." What's that? What's there left for you to do? Nothing. It is finished. Did he? Did he say? I mean, did he say? Oh well, you need to do this, or you need to do that. You need to go here and you need to go there. You need to do this. You need to pay that. It's finished, isn't it? That tells me that there's nothing that I can do to get to heaven. He's done it. It's finished. Amen? I don't have to bring any more sacrifice other than this mortal body, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. That's all I got to do. And the holiness, is it mine? No, it's his. It's his righteousness. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Therefore, because it was the, the preparation day that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who was, has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scriptures should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. Even in death, he is continually fulfilling prophecy. And again, after, uh, again, another scripture says that they shall look on him whom they pierced. Two prophecies right there, right at his death. Fulfilled. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, 
but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus, and Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips, strips of linen with uh, spices of the custom of the Jews to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. I read that and I thought to myself, wow, what else happened in the garden? Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, didn't they? And God here in the garden bringing back reconciliation, bringing back that, that, that law that was broken back then, the law of, of, of I, oh, I can't even get the word down. Righteousness. See, Adam and Eve, they didn't have anything. They didn't have any sin on them yet. But when they, when they, spelled, or when they, when they moved against God, they took the forbidden fruit and then became sin from Adam on up to Moses to Christ. Sin reigned. And Jesus right here taking care of it in a dead body, putting it into the garden back again at the beginning. Now, when Mary came to the tomb, some things happened. Before I go back there, I got too much going in my mind. I need to calm it down. Now, on the first day of the week, in verse 20, it says, Now, on the first day of the week, or chapter 20, verse 1, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Who is that disciple's name? John. I'm going to point this out to you. And said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went and the other disciple, John, and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. One of the, one of the disagreements or one of the ways that they try to uh, dis, disannul this prophecy of Jesus rising was that they were saying, well, maybe they went to the wrong tomb. They found an empty tomb, and that's why they thought he had risen. But I want to point out to you that when Jesus was on the cross, he looked at his mother, and he says to the disciple whom he loved, John, behold your mother. So John was present at the crucifixion. Therefore, he would have been present at his burial, and it says that he ran and he beat Peter to that, to that grave to the burial. So that nullifies, or that, that kills that idea that, oh, they went to the wrong grave. No, because John knew where they had laid him to, let, to rest. And he stooped down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter followed him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. And you remember Jewish culture, if they were coming back, they would fold their napkins so that their stuff wouldn't get taken away. Jesus folds the napkin saying, I am coming back. Amen. The linen clothes, but folded together in its place. Then the other disciples whom came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. See, it took Peter getting in there and seeing a little bit closer, didn't it? When we read the word of God, we need to get in a little closer, don't we? It's not enough just to get a surface look. We've got to get in a little bit deeper. We've got to get in, we've got to get in a little bit deeper into the Word. Sometimes the Word studies, they, they uncover a lot of different things that we didn't see before. When we talk about love, there's two different types of love. I can love my, I can love my shoes, but that's just love. A lot of you guys, you can love your trucks, but that's just love. But then there's the agape love, the unconditional love that only God can give, that God places in you. And that means that it doesn't matter how bad that truck runs. You still love it, don't you? That's the unconditional love. It doesn't matter how many times it left you walking. You got to get in deeper. Be like the disciple. Go in and see what the Lord has for you. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and she wept 
She stooped down and looked into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting, one at the end or one at the head of the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. It's amazing, because Mary saw him go through the punishment, didn't she? She saw him on the cross. She saw him just torn, brutalized. And here he stands before her and doesn't have a knowledge that it's him. In other, word, in other books, he says, it says that she assumed him to be the gardener. Would you recognize Jesus if you saw him? That's a real question. Would you recognize Jesus if you saw him? I'm asking that because that's part of, of when, you, when you get into the right relationship with him, how will you know that it's him and not somebody else? How do you know it's him and not the enemy? You have to understand and know who he is. You have to know him so that when you see him, you'll know it's him. Amen? Yeah, it says right there, she supposing him to be the gardener said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and, saw, and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. See, in those days, the testimony of a woman was not that great. It was not a reliable thing that they counted on. So if this was false, why would the disciples put Mary in first as saying that he had risen? if they didn't think it was going to stand. Right? Okay, so here he is. Jesus appears to Mary. He comes out, he shows her, tells her, okay. She goes, runs back, tells the disciples. Uh, let's see, where are we? Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that she had spoken these things, or that he had spoken these things to her. Then the same day at evening, be being the first day of the week, when the, the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace, be, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. He's already commissioned them on their mission. And then, or when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Then there's Thomas, called a twin. One of the twelve had not with, or was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord, so he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And then just eight days later, his disciples were again inside, the, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen, because you have seen me, you have, you, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. I, I believe that because I believed, the Lord revealed more of himself to me. I believe it's in our belief, in our walk of faith, 
as we believe and grow to believe, the Lord becomes more real to us, doesn't he? How do you express love to somebody, or how do you receive love from somebody if they never express it to you? Is that pretty hard? How do you know? They have to tell you, right? And then the more that love is expressed, the more that love is shown on both parts. When we come to the Lord, we have to move in that love and show Him that we have admiration for Him, for the things that He's done for us, for bringing us out of the pit. The closer we get to Him, the closer He gets to us. The more He's willing to reveal His, his character to us. To keep us from that place of, oh, I don't know if it's God. I don't know if it's His will or not. To put us back in that place of faith where we can say that was God. That was God right there. Okay? Now here's the, the cool part about it. Jesus is risen. He's not in the tomb anymore. I, as I mentioned, Linda has been in that tomb. And there was nobody in there, was there, Linda? Was there any trace of bones? Was there any trace of anything? It was empty, wasn't it? Because the Lord has risen. That's our proof. And let me tell you something. If, the, if, God, if Jesus hadn't have risen, and these, these Pharisees, they had to produce a, pot, a body, and they crucified plenty of people in those days. They could have grabbed anybody and said, hey, here he is right here. And they couldn't. They couldn't fight against it because he had risen. He was witnessed by several people. Acts 4.12 says, Nor is there any salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven among men by which we must be saved. It's only the name of Jesus Christ that we can be saved. Only the name of Jesus Christ that went to the cross for our sins can we be saved. No other name. Whatever faiths are out there, I guarantee they're not. They're, they're just not able to bring eternal life. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Say amen when you're there. This is Paul. Paul was on the road to Damascus when he was on his way to persecute the church. That's what his job was. He took it upon himself to get rid of these Christian mongrels and, and prove that Jesus was never risen, that this faith never existed. Okay? And on that road to Damascus, he had an experience. He and a few of other people that he had with him, a few other soldiers that he had with him, they were on their way to persecute the church. And all of a sudden, there was a light that shined around them and knocked him clean off his horse. And he heard a voice, and he says, Who are you, Lord? And the voice tells him, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. In other words, Jesus was telling him, Stop fighting me. You know it's true that I have risen. You know that I am the Son of God. Your faith is, is useless. All the things that you thought were, were, would get you into heaven, all the religion that you put in front of me, that is wrong. I am Jesus, and it is I who paid the price for you to get into heaven. That's pretty much what he was telling him in a nutshell. And so Paul, he, after the light diminishes some, the people that were with him, the other soldiers that were with him, they marveled because they heard the voice, but they couldn't see anybody. Paul himself, engulfed by light, as the light began to diminish, he went to stand up and he couldn't see. He had to be led away for three days. He was in prayer and fasting. And finally, the Lord sent a servant to him, prayed over him, and scales fell off his eyes. And he was able to see again. And from there, you know him as the Apostle Paul, who used to be Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of Christians. Amen? 1 Corinthians 15, 1. This is Paul writing this. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you, have, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, use, unless you be believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins. How did Paul receive it? He received it by revelation from Jesus. According to the scriptures. So he knows, Paul went by the scriptures, that Jesus would die for our sins. 
and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Again, giving credit to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas, who is known as Peter, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. Is that a dead Christ? That's a risen Christ, isn't it? Of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. And what is, what is he describing is that over 500 people had seen him. Some of them have died believing or with their faith in Christ, but there was still some alive at that time. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by, my, by me also as by one born out of time. As I said before, Paul himself saw Christ on the road to Damascus, transforming him. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but the grace of God, I, or but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. How many of you have the grace of God living inside you? Amen. Amen. Something happened to me when I came to the Lord. John 1, or 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. In Revelation, it talks about when God comes down, there is no need for the sun, there's no need for the moon or the stars, for he will be the light of the world. When Jesus walked on the earth, he was the light of the world. Now his light resides in you. Guess what? You carry that light. That same light that brings life to all people. Okay? In verse 6 it says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to be cleansed, uh, to be cleansed of us from all unrighteousness. Let me say that again. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, there's some faiths out there that preach that you don't need to, say, uh, you don't need to repent. How many of you apologize to your friend when you wrong them? Isn't God much more? It's not that you can make yourself right before God, but He wants you to acknowledge that you've wronged. That's what it's about. Amen? Yes. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. My children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. By, now by this we know that we know him. Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truthly, truly, the love of God is perfected in him. Now, whether we get up in the morning and we say, you know what, I'm a good person. I'm going to walk around today and I'm going to be good. I want to give you a test. And it goes like this. If you are judged by God's Ten Commandments. I mean, I don't know if you know the Ten Commandments, anybody? Steal, kill, adultery, all, that, all those things, right? Now, here's the test. If you were judged by God's Ten Commandments, do you think that you would make it into heaven? No. Well, yeah, I'm a good person. I've never killed anybody. I've never lied. Here's the thing. Have you ever told even a little lie? Hey, it's just a little white lie. It's a little joke, right? Right? 
What does that make you? Okay. Have you ever, have you ever talked about somebody when they're not in the room? Did you know that that's murder? In the Bible, that's murder. That's killing their character. And they don't even have to be present. So what does that make you? A murderer. And then Jesus talks on this side of grace that if you look at a person in the, in the, in the opposite sex as desirable or lusting after them, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Have you ever done that? And so by your own admission, under those three, you've already admitted that you're a liar, a murderer, and an adulterer at heart. And that's only three of the ten. Do you think that you would still make it into heaven? That's why Jesus died for us. That's why he went to the cross, because he took our punishment on the cross so that we wouldn't have to. It's that simple. And it's not simple because it was rough for him. But you know what? It's not that easy because guess who gets in the way? Pride gets in the way, doesn't it? I can do it myself. I can still do this. I can, I can make it. Turn to Romans 6.21. I'll start in verse 20. It says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. That fruit did, uh, what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of, these, of those things is death. But now, having been set free from the sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. I had a debt that could not be paid by me, by my mom and all her prayers, by anybody. But that debt was paid by Christ over a period of three days when he was in the tomb. That's awesome. Turn over to Romans 10 right there. Romans 10, chapter 1. Or verse 1, sorry. Romans 10. One. I'm not even following that anymore. Romans 10, 1. It says this, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they be, may be saved. So Paul's praying for Israel. In verse 2 it says, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. I loved God. I believed in God. I wanted to do right for God before I came to the Lord. I wanted to do right for, before God. I knew that there was a heaven, that, that, that I believed in that, that there was a heaven, and I wanted to get to heaven. I just didn't know how. But I thought, you know what, as long as I'm doing my good deeds, I'm going to get there. God's going to love me. He's going to let me in anyway. I'm hoping to knock on the door and say, Lord, will you let me in? That was my idea of walking rightly. It says this in verse 3. It says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. See, I had no clue how righteous God was. And seeking to establish their own righteousness. That was me. Because I didn't steal or because I didn't kill. Because I didn't commit adultery. All those things that I thought that I had control of. Living my own righteousness. My own idea of righteousness. Have not submitted to the righteousness of God. I, I knew there was a God, and I believed in, in how he was a holy God. We went to church, and we behaved, you know, little kids. We were closed in. We didn't want to break the rules. You know, I got, I got grounded from church when I was about 10 years old. We, they used to have pews like this, and they had these little clipper things that held paper. And I was over there messing with it, and pow, made a big old loud noise. And my mom looked at me, and she goes... I knew I had it. I got home and I got the great bad news that I was never going to have to go to church again. I didn't like going to church. I didn't understand it. I sat in the pew and I didn't hear anything. Couldn't make heads or tails of it. All I knew was by looking at the stuff that they had on the wall that there was a Christ and that one day I was going to meet him. I didn't know how. I just thought if I was a good person, he'd let me in. 
But then I quickly realized as an adult the severity of my sin and what it really took to get me there. In verse 4 it says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. See, when we try to live under the law of, well, God loves me, I can get in, he'll let me in. That's the wrong law to live on. Well, I don't believe in the Ten Commandments. I don't believe in God's laws. Well, that's even worse because now you're not only going to die without the law, you're not going to die with Christ either. You're in deeper stuff. Because one or the other is real. Okay? Verse 6, but the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above? Or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from dead? But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the Mouth, confession is made unto salvation. I came to the Lord not in a humble state, almost in an arrogant state. And I said, God, if you're real, I got to see this. I was like Thomas. Lord, if you're real, I got to see this. What are all these people talking about? What is it that they're talking about? I really want to know. But there were several times that I would see a person that was actually following the Lord and believed in what they were listening to, believed what they were reading. And I saw them and I thought, I, wanted, I want what they have. I want what they got. And I remember when that gentleman came into our house and, and, and he shared the gospel with my family. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, I'm going to get down there. I'm going to see what he's got. I know he's brainwashing them. I, I was going to just stand there and be like, come on, dude, you need to get out of here. Got to protect my family, right? And as he talked about it, it kind of like made sense. I'm like going, hey, you know, maybe there's something to this. And he led us in this prayer. And he said, okay, if you said that prayer, you get into the kingdom of God. And I thought, wait a minute. Where, where's all the other stuff I got to do? Where's everything that I need to get done? And I thought, okay, that's it. I, I, I'm going to wait. I was expecting fireworks. I was expecting the big bright lights and all of a sudden, you know, there was a party or something going on. Where's the explosion? Where's God? Did he come down and, you know, boom? Nothing. And for a week, he wouldn't leave me alone. For a week, he was in my mind. He was in my heart. And I remember around that forklift sitting there, moving some lumber around, thinking to myself, I said, okay, God, today's the day. We're going to find out. I got off of work, I went home, and I told the kids, don't bother me, I'm going upstairs to pray. I don't know what they thought of that, because I hadn't been praying up to that point, or didn't even mention anything to God about him. I go upstairs, and I get on my bed right there, and I kneel next to my bed, and I get down, and I say, okay, God, if you're real, show me. I want to know. And it was like, all of a sudden, there was a presence in that room. And he showed me this Rolodex of things that I did. And they just kept flipping. My life history just kept flipping and flipping and flipping. All the stupid things that I did. All the times that I spoke against my mom. Every time, because my mom raised me alone. If that wasn't hard enough, I didn't have a dad. Now I, gotta, now I gotta get reconciled to a father I didn't even know. Or I thought I knew. And I'm there on my knees and I'm begging. I'm saying, Lord, show me. And he says, okay, you got it. Here you go, Jimmy. You just want some more gimme? I sit there and I, I watched that Rolodex roll of all the things that I had done against the Lord. And when I thought, okay, I can't take anymore, that's enough. He's like, oh no, you got a lifetime of sin here, buddy, look at this. And he keeps rolling that index, that, that Rolodex to me and I see the sin back. And he brought me clear back to when I was a little kid. And I remember there was this glass bottle in the back step. That was just off the back step, and my mom told me to pick it up. I looked out there to the bottle, and I just turned around and went back in the house. A little bit later, I hear her calling me. Rick, get over here. Did you pick up that bottle? I said, yeah. She goes, no, you didn't. Get out there and pick it up like I told you. I was like. I 
She always does her job. He showed me that. I was, I was speaking against my mom, calling her names, and I was angry because she caught me in a lie. God showed me that. And let me tell you something. When God shows you things like that, it's not fun. It isn't fun. It pierced me to my heart that how could he know this? I had forgot about it. And he said, no, I'm digging that thing up because I need to uproot it from you. I need to take it out of your heart and put in a new heart for me. That's God. That's God. The righteousness of God. And, and time and time after that, I would go to the altar and I would open my heart and I would say, Lord, anything that you have, I want. I need more of you in my heart because I knew that in and of myself, there was no good thing. I had to go to the Lord and I had to tell him, I need more of you, Lord, till there's nothing left of myself that I can pour myself out to everybody I come into contact with and tell them about how much you love them. It's one thing to tell you that Jesus loves you, but it's another thing to show you how he loves you. And I am the hand and foot of God. I'm the mouth of God. You are the hand and foot and mouth of God. You are the living body of God on the earth. His spirit dwells in you, moves in you. His spirit moved yesterday. There was a kid, there were several kids that walked out of here smiles on their face. Mothers came and got breakfast made for them and they didn't have to clean up the mess they came in they ate that was awesome reaching out to the community and showing them the light of Christ in the church see God doesn't call you to the fro to be the frozen chosen you got to be moving you got to be active you got to be alive you got to show people that you have a love living inside you and that love is so abounding so great that it just has to burst out from you and you got to show it to people. Wherever you go, no matter the situation, when everybody else is screaming and running the other way, you run towards that and you say, no, in Jesus' name, I have Christ living in me and we're going to figure this out. How many of you work with Jesus throughout your day? Amen. Amen. Okay. I thought I had to, that was it. Okay. Listen, we are entering the age where, okay, you have Christ in you, right? If you don't know Christ, if you don't have Jesus in your heart, raise your hand. Everybody here has Jesus in their heart? Seriously? That's awesome. Awesome. Yes, that's awesome. This is what I'm going to do. Did you know that Colossians says that in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him? If there's ever been a moment in your week, even this last week, if there's ever been a moment in that week when you thought to yourself, I need this. Not God, I need this. I want you to raise your hand. Something other than God. Raise your hand. Okay. No, that's fine. That's fine. It's in those moments. See, the devil's been at it for over 2,000 years. He's been at it a lifetime of, of spiritual warfare. It says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in heavenly places. And the devil has gotten so awesome at how he does his work, he attacks you just like he did to Jesus in the Word. Did you know that? And he begins to whisper lightly, you need this, you need that. That's not enough. Jesus isn't enough. God isn't enough. You're not really saved. You're not righteous enough. Don't go to church today. And people give in to that. Have you ever been in a room when somebody yawns? What happens? contagious I'm going to challenge you through this next week that you begin 
to walk in that completeness of Christ. And I want to hear what you've done. I want to hear reports. I want to hear what it is that you've done for Christ because you are complete in him and you're not in the world. That makes you incomplete. Complete in him means that you're walking in victory. You're walking with an attitude of gratitude. You're walking with a, 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 an appearance like Stephen as an angel. Do you understand what I'm saying? There is a light shining off you that people are going to take away and they're going to go, wow, I want what they have. Oh, but you don't understand, Pastor. I'm, I don't feel well. I, I, you know, I'm sick all the time. I, things just aren't going great. I don't have a vehicle or I don't. For in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. In Matthew, it says that if you seek first his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. The enemy keeps you at bay with all these little things that take your sight off of him, off of Jesus, and then you sink. Nobody likes a sinking week, do they? What's a sinking week? A sinking week is a stinking week. Hey, listen, if you want to get close to God, uh, before we get into, uh, we're going to do communion, and then I would like, I want to lead you in a prayer, because I know that there's some people that are kind of confused right now. It's all right. I want you to close your eyes, bow your head. If you don't have the relationship that you know that you should have with Jesus. I want you to raise your hand. Nobody looking around, just raise your hand. Amen. Thank you, Lord. If you have allowed somebody else or something else to sit in that seat where Jesus should be sitting, he's got the first seat in your house. If you've allowed something else to take that place in that seat, I want you to raise your hand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, if you just need a touch from God, you know that his spirit is powerful and it can transform your life this morning. It's a resurrection day. Jesus is alive. And if you want a rekindling of your spirit, a passion reignited, I want you to raise your hand. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to have Teresa come up and play. I'm going to open these altars up. I'm going to pray for a fresh anointing of his spirit upon you. And I want you to do something for me. I want you to take your communion cup home, and I want you to do communion in your house. And I want you to pray over your house. I want you to pray the life of Christ, the new resurrected life, to come into your house because that is your church. That is your dwelling place. You have victory, but you need to bring that victory home with you and let it resonate in your home because something has gotten in there that is knocking you down. Something has gotten in you that has misplaced you. Take that victory back. In the name of Jesus, pray throughout your house. Anoint the doorposts. Let the Spirit of God dwell in there richly. If you raise your hand and you said, Lord, Lord, I need more of you. I need a fresh anointing of your Spirit. I want you to move down here immediately. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. 
They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's still room up here. Come on. If you feel like you have misplaced your place in the Lord, don't hesitate. Let the Lord do that work in your life that you need to have done. It's Resurrection Sunday. Let that spirit within you rise up. You have a lion living inside of you. Let him roar. Let him speak. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, I pray for these folks up here this morning. God, I know how awesome you are. Lord, you do not disappoint. I pray for your spirit, a fresh anointing of your spirit, Lord, upon each one of these people right here now, Lord, in Jesus' name. I pray, Father for the manifestation of your spirit in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. I pray that they would come alive. Rekindle that spirit for you, the Lord. Testify according to your word that they are your son, your daughter. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. A fresh anointing, Lord. New, bold, courageous, Ignite that passion, Lord. Help them to set their face a flint to the mission that you reveal to them, Lord. I ask it in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for healing upon each and every one of them, Lord. Healing in their souls, healing in their minds, healing in their bodies, healing in their finance, healing in their marriages, healing in their unity of the family, Lord. Healing in their loneliness, Lord. Father, I pray that you would comfort them. Give them the peace that surpasses all understanding. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I want you to lift your face up to heaven. And let the light of God shine on your face. Let his anointing pour in and through you. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All heaven and earth is taking note because you step forward. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you that you meet them where they have met you, Lord. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you don't know the Lord Jesus in your heart as you feel like you ought, I want to lead you in a prayer. Keep your eyes closed. I want to lead you. Bow your head. I want you to repeat after me. Everybody together. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your son, Jesus. I believe that he is your son. Jesus, thank you for going to the cross for me. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. God, I pray that you forgive me of my sins. In the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless.